Lighthouse, stay busy, but don't be a busybody. Isn't, isn't that great advice? That's the advice that we're going to get to today in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Congratulations, we've made it to the end of the church epistles, the, the epistles that are written to churches. Tomorrow we'll start the pastoral epistles where instead of being written to specific churches, they're written to specific people. Then maybe we'll get into the general epistles that are written to be circulated among a lot of churches. But, but here kind of is a, it's not the end of a journey. It's not a period to our journey through the epistles, but it's definitely a comma as we get to the end of 2 Thessalonians. And, and Paul is going to start 2 Thessalonians 3 by, um, by saying, hey, finally, brothers, pray for us. I love that Paul really recognizes the importance of prayer both ways. He's praying for um, people, and people are praying for him, and he encourages that. You know, it's it's not just, oh, Paul is the high and mighty, blesses them with his prayers because he's closer to God or whatever. No, but he says we're in this together. Man, he's over and over, he said, this is how I'm praying for you. And then he says, hey, here's how you can pray for us. How neat that it's like, I'm praying for you, and here's the prayer request. As you think about me, here's how to pray. Pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored. You know what Paul really cares about is the gospel moving forward. I, I, I want my prayer life to be more like that. Hey, if you pray for me, would you pray that the word of the Lord would speed forward and be honored? And as happened among you, Paul goes, you know how your ministry is like exploded? You know how in Thessalonica things of like the, the, the gospel has spread? And that's what we're hungry for everywhere we go. What a cool, what a cool thing to pray. And then the real practical piece he says, and that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men. Paul says, man, there's just, all I want to do is, is teach about Jesus and all I find myself doing is defending myself, you know, and and uh, so Paul looks around and goes, practically, we'd love the freedom to not be encumbered by these wicked or evil men, but to really go go and, and, and do our thing as we proclaim the gospel. And we have confidence in the Lord about you that you are doing the will of, uh, that doing and will to do the things that we command. May the Lord direct your hearts uh, to the love of God and the steadfastness of Christ. Just a sweet little comment about, hey, we know you want to do the right thing. You're doing the right thing. We know you want to continue doing the right thing. So keep doing the right thing. And then this, from almost out of nowhere, it seems like, this hasn't been a topic in the letter so far, but Paul wants to solve something for them that apparently was a problem in Thessalonica. He says, now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away... We command you, brothers. This is not like, hey, some good advice. Sometimes Paul says stuff like that. Hey, this is just some good advice. Here he's saying, look, I command you. I'm your, you know, your pastor. I planted that church. Here's how I want you to live. He says, now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, Lord Jesus Christ, he is serious about this command, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in a in accord to the traditions that you receive from us. So some people think that what's going on here is, or it could be a one of a couple of things. Some people have thought, you know how all of the Thessalonica, their questions were about the end times and they're worried about people are dying. Has Jesus come back? What's going on? And so maybe it's that this so much staring up into the heavens, waiting for Jesus to come back had, had taken hold of them that they'd stopped working hard day to day. You know, they, they weren't doing their jobs well. They weren't representing Christ well in the world. They weren't working hard in the church. Rather, they kind of head for the hills and said, well, Jesus is coming back. Why should we do anything else? The other thing that could possibly be happening here, and we, did, we just don't know exactly what Paul's, um, the situation he's addressing here, but the other thing that might be happening is that it, it, just like elsewhere in the early church, there was a spirit of generosity and people were meeting needs where needs needed to be met. And so you had wealthy Christians that were meeting the needs of, of other Christians who were, you know, had, had real practical needs. And then what happened was those people that had their needs met, instead of saying, wow, thank you very much. I received this in the name of the Lord and I'm going to, you know, do a good job and work hard, started to rely on those wealthy Christians 
as the source of their provision instead of relying on God as they, you know, put in the effort, put in the work. So whatever it was, man, this is really a good encouragement for us. Christians should be hardworking people. Christians should be people who are first one there, last one leave, you know, do all of those things. And, and we have to rest as well. Let's not be workaholics. The idea of Sabbath is like built into um, the, the very foundation of our faith. And yet Paul says, look, when the world, the world is looking at us and we're looking at each other. And the world wants to know what kind of people follow Jesus. Paul goes, don't even, don't even hang out with somebody who's idle, somebody who's not willing to work. Don't even hang out. I command you um, to keep away from any brother who's walking in idleness. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us because we were not idle when we were with you. Paul says, we work day and night. So the gift we gave you of the gospel we didn't charge you for it. And Paul, he's going to say again here, look, we have the right to charge you for it. It's not wrong to take a, a, um, a salary from preaching. But he didn't because he wanted to be a good example to them. And he didn't want people thinking that this was just a way to make money. No, he said, no, you know, when we were there, we worked day and night. We worked hard in the church. We worked hard out of the church. And so you're not following our example if you're sitting around not working hard. Man, I think that us pastors need to take this seriously. Um, this, is, this should not just be a, a one-day-a-week job. You know, we should be people that work hard in the ministry. The ministry should not be a lazy profession. Our study should be, uh, should be sincere. Our prayer should be sincere. Our, you know, managing the congregation, managing... Um, the facilities, all that stuff we should take seriously as church leaders. And then in similar way to, to set that good example. And Paul uh, wants people in the church to be a bunch of hardworking folk. That makes sense. Um, that Christians would not find our identity in our work, but that we would find our identity in Christ, and that would free us up to work hard with joy. That we wouldn't work like we're working for man, but like we're working for God. Okay, so verse 11. For uh, we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Oh, oh that's so beautiful. Paul says, look, we hear some of you are idle, but you're not staying still. You're causing trouble in everybody else's life. You're in everybody else's mess kit. You don't mind your own business. You're getting everybody else's business and telling everybody else how to live. He says, no, you need to work hard yourself. You have, you're not busy, but you're a busybody. Man, that if, if you have any advice to give anybody, that might be the advice. Be somebody who is hardworking, who stays busy, but is not a busybody. Now, such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and earn their own living. Man, do your work quietly. Don't make a big deal about yourself and earn your own living. Even to the point where earlier he says, hey, uh, look, if somebody's unwilling to work, they shouldn't eat. And I don't think Paul is saying he wants people to starve to death, but as they're having these common meals, you know, this is not about a forget about charity and and if, if somebody's uh, down on their luck, you shouldn't help them. No, this is rather, you have people who've worked very hard all week, and they're bringing this common meal, and they're sitting down at the table and sharing, and, and people who absolutely had the ability to, but just refused to bring anything, just refused to, to be a, a, a working part of the family. You know, at Lighthouse, we always say that our mission starts with be loved. Be loved, worship, follow, grow, go. It doesn't start with get to work. We don't want to be people who find our identity in what we do. But as we receive the love of God, it necessitates, hey, I'm in the family just because I'm in the family. God just loves me. But families include hard work. Families include everybody working hard to make the family run smoothly. Church is the same. Don't be idle. Be busy. But don't be a busybody. As for you, brothers... Do not grow weary in doing good. If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with them, that he may be ashamed. Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. 
Good advice, Paul. Paul says, look, sometimes you're going to get tired. You're going to get weary doing good. But be encouraged. Don't, don't grow weary doing good. Keep your head up. Paul is saying, hey, so much of this letter has been about when's Jesus coming back? Man, do your job simply. Work hard. Don't make a big deal about yourself. And don't grow tired as you're waiting. Jesus is coming back. He loves you. We're going to be okay. Maybe love, Lighthouse.